Here's your lecture for chapter 10. There is a second video that I've uh, made that has all of the equations that you're going to encounter over the course of chapter 10. So I encourage you to watch that first. <clears throat> Write down all of the equations so you have them on a sheet next to you. So as we go through these problems, when we hit a problem uh, or, or an example question, you can pause me Work out the problem using that sheet of equations next to you, and then come back and see how we've worked it, okay? So, chapter 10 is all about gases, and uh, gases have some basic properties that we've sort of already talked about earlier in the semester, talked about solids, liquids, and gases, and uh, just to focus on the properties of gases themselves, one is that they're compressible, and the reason for that is because there's space between the molecules, Unlike solids and liquids, there's actually room between the molecules here. So you can move those molecules closer together, which means that gases are compressible. They assume the shape and volume of the container and that they have very low densities in comparison with liquids and solids. <clears throat> now the main thing that we're going to, uh, scientists have used to study gases is called kinetic molecular theory. And the idea is that, um, the model predicts correct behavior under most conditions. Um, but like most models, kinetic molecular theory is not perfect. Um, when you get to extremes of temperature and pressure, um, kinetic molecular theory kind of falls apart. But under most conditions, uh, especially those that we're going to deal with, the, the kinetic molecular theory model works quite well. <clears throat> so the main parts of the kinetic molecular theory are these is that we have a collection of particles in constant motion. So gases really, the gas particles, uh, gas molecules never really stop moving, okay? The only times that they do stop moving is when we get to temperatures that are uh, low enough that pretty much all molecular motion ceases. But until we get to that point, um, the gas particles are in constant motion. Part two is that there are no attractions or repulsions between the particles. Basically, we treat them as if they are billiard balls. They're just going to bounce off of each other like, uh, like hard marbles or, like I said, billiard balls. Okay, They bounce off the sides of the container and they bounce off of each other with no attraction or repulsion. There's a lot of space between the particles um, compared to the particles themselves. So lots of room in between those individual molecules. And the last part is that the speed of the particles increases with increasing temperature. So if I take a collection of gas molecules and I raise the temperature, they're going to move faster. And conversely, if I cool them down, they're going to move slower. And I sort of already mentioned this uh, before, is that if we get down close to absolute zero, almost all molecular motion ceases, including physical travel or, or kinetic travel. Okay? So there are three, uh, excuse me, four main things that we can um, measure with gases, and those are pressure, volume, the amount of gas, and temperature. And what we have in this image is a, a basic um, version of what's called a manometer. So it's a manometer. Okay, and this was how they started to, uh, scientists started to understand um, gases. Basically, down at the bottom here, you have uh, a pool of mercury, okay? And back in the day, they didn't understand that mercury was uh, a neurotoxin. And so you would actually have scientists immersing themselves like elbows deep in pools of mercury because they had no idea that it was even remotely dangerous. It was just liquid metal. Um, and so what they have is they, they started with a vacu an evacuated tube and they Im inverted it into the pool of mercury. And what they found was that when they released the vacuum, the mercury got pulled up into the tube. And then what they did was they quite literally delineated the sides of the tube with markings in millimeters, right? And they found that um, under normal conditions at sea level, the mercury filled the tube up to a height of 760 millimeters of mercury. And so what they decided uh, after a little bit of time and, and work was that this was the same thing as one atmosphere, okay? And then they saw, you know, with changes in the weather, 
Sometimes that, uh, you know, when a big storm would roll in, we say that the pressure is dropping. That's what we're talking about is that when heavy weather would roll in, the level of mercury would actually go lower in the tube because the pressure of the atmosphere on the pool of mercury was slightly less. And then on, on days of really, really nice weather, the atmospheric pressure is pulling, pushing a little bit farther and the atmospheric pressure goes up a little bit. But they standardized the idea that 760 millimeters of mercury was uh, standard pressure. That's at one atmospheric pressure. Okay. So the idea of pressure, those of you that are, are taking physics or have taken physics, is basically force over area. So when we talk about atmospheric pressure, we're talking about all of the air above us and around us pushing down on us. Okay, and thankfully we live in, on a planet where, you know, everything is, is a manageable level, um, so to speak. Like we are able to comfortably withstand the pressure of the atmosphere above us and around us. You know, if we were on, if we were to sort of transfer, transport ourselves to some place like Jupiter, Jupiter is infinitely massive. Well, not infinitely, but much, much more massive than the Earth. And so you would have much, much more atmosphere pressing down on you and... Truth be told, if we were to be on the surface of Jupiter, we would be squashed in an instant by the weight of all that atmosphere and gas. Okay. So since pressure is the result of collisions, okay, so if we have a container of gas, all of those gas particles are moving at all times, so they're constantly colliding with the walls of the, of the container, and all those collisions is force over area, so that causes pressure. So if we increase the number of particles, we're getting more collisions and more pressure. Okay? But if we decrease the number of particles, we get fewer collisions and as a result, lower pressure. Now there's a lot of different kinds of units of pressure. Um, the most common is atmospheres. Second most common is millimeters of mercury. Now it also says, or tor. Now tor is named after an Italian scientist named, and I'm probably going to spell his name wrong, Torricelli. Okay, and right about the time that, that most scientists were coming up with this idea of pressure in millimeters of mercury, Torricelli was doing his work in Italy, and he came up with the same idea, and he decided that 760 tor was the correct unit, okay? But we also know that 760 millimeters of mercury is one atmosphere. So 760 millimeters of mercury equals 760 tor, okay? They are, they are the same unit, essentially. Now, why we have two units that mean the same thing with different names Still, why they haven't gotten rid of one or the other, I don't know. I wish I did knew, know the answer to why we still have TOR. Um, not sure. But that's what it's talking about when you see that T-O-O-R. Other units that are common are Pascals, named after a French scientist, which has, thankfully, different units than um, millimeters of mercury and TOR. Another common one is PSI. It's common in the United States. If you've ever filled up your car tires, you know that your car tire gets filled with, you know, 35 some odd PSI, pounds per square inch. And then we have atmospheres um, uh, is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury or TOR. 1,125, 1, um, 101,325, excuse me, pascals is one atmosphere. 14.7 PSI is one atmosphere. Or 29.92 inches of mercury. Now this one is, we put this one in here because this is common for meteorology. Me, meteorology. Okay, if you were ever to look up barometric pressure on uh, a weather app, you'll find... Um, the barometric pressure given in inches of mercury. So let's do a little bit of conversion here. So um, lots of the problems that you're about to face or, or have already faced with um, mastering chemistry 
involve situations where you have to convert units of pressure. So we're going to use those equivalents just like we've done all the other conversions in our class. So we start with our given information, 0.311 atmospheres, and we want to go to millimeters of mercury. One atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury, so we end up with an answer of 236 millimeters of mercury. Now just as a reminder, as we hit these example problems, I encourage you to try and hit pause, work out the problem on paper, and then come back and watch how the problem is um, worked out. That will be your most beneficial use of this time watching this video. And so there are a number of gas laws that we're going to um, encounter. And the first that we're dealing with is called Boyle's Law. And it is the relationship of pressure and volume. Okay, so the temperature and the amount of gas are going to be remain, remaining constant. The pressure of the gas sample increases for a decrease in volume. Now, this is something that you've encountered in your uh, real life probably at some point in time. Uh, most of us have tried to, um, using like a bicycle pump, most of us have tried to cover the end of the hose of the bicycle pump and then press the pump down. And it gets more and more difficult the farther you press, right? Until it eventually pushes your thumb off at the end of the hose. That's because as you decrease the volume inside the cylinder of the gas pump, it increases the pressure. Okay, so the important thing to recognize about Boyle's Law is that volume and pressure are inversely proportional. This is extremely important relationship okay, for interpretation of, of, of things. So you can determine whether or not pressure will go up or down or volume will go up or down depending on that relationship. You can do that even without numbers in most cases. And I encourage you as you do these problems to be able to look at the answers you get and say, wait a minute, that's not right because the rate relationship says it shouldn't be, okay? So let's take a look at a, an uh, example of how this works. So if the amount of gas and the temperature of the gas are the same, so you see that we have the same number of, of um, brownish burgundy colored uh, marbles or whatever inside each cylinder, if I decrease the volume that pressure or, or the, the cylinder we've in the right hand picture, we've decreased the volume of that cylinder by pressing down on it on the piston. We've now halved the volume and by decreasing the volume by one half, we've doubled the pressure. Okay, so inversely proportional as the volume decreases, the pressure increases. So if volume goes down, then pressure goes up and vice versa. If volume goes up, pressure will go down. Okay, inverse proportionality. Right, so Boyle's Law relates pressure and volume. Okay, so even if you weren't given these equations at the top of the slide, okay, the question that you want to ask when you're faced with any of these gas problems, here's your question. What is changing. Okay, that is your main concern when you're reading through these problems. The problems that students have most often with this type of work is interpreting the word problem. Okay, So the question that you want to answer is what is changing? Okay, So in this case, so we have a cylinder equipped with a movable piston and the applied pressure is four atmospheres, there's pressure, and a volume of six liters, there's volume, okay? So it says, what is the volume of the cylinder if the applied pressure is decreased by one atmosphere? So we're changing a volume and we're, or excuse me, a pressure and we're changing a volume. So volume and pressure are the things that are changing here. Now a useful tactic is to make a list, okay? So even if you're not entirely sure what's changing in this problem, if you make a list of the things that you're given, it will help you to figure it out. So we're given a pressure of four atmospheres and a volume of six liters. Okay. 
Then it says if the volume is changed, what is, um, excuse me, if the volume of the cylinder, what is the volume of the cylinder if the applied pressure decreases? So we have a new pressure of one atmosphere, and it wants to know what the new volume is. Okay, so you see by making my list, I have P and V, P and V. So you can look at your list of equations, and you'll find the one that is just pressure and volume. Okay, pressure and volume are the things that are changing. Okay, so Boyle's Law. So what we want to solve for V2, so I'm going to rearrange my equation and say V2 equals P, P1, V1 over P2. And then I can simply plug in my numbers. Okay. Four atmospheres times six liters divided by one atmosphere gives me 24 liters. Okay, so here's where you want to use that relationship of pressure and volume and determine whether or not this answer makes any sense. So we have a pressure of four atmospheres and then we decrease the pressure. So if the pressure goes down, that means the volume should go up. Our initial volume was four atmosphere, or excuse me, six liters. And our volume has gone up to 24 liters. So by that inverse relationship, we can see that our answer, at least on that level, makes sense.